been a while since I talked about Christian TikTokers, but I stumbled across a couple new ones recently and I couldn't pass it up. This is Benjamin Weber. He's an evangelical Christian. Now, before we get into some of the clips, I want to make something clear. I have nothing against Christians at all. That's not what this is about. In fact, I want to work with Christians to stamp out extremism. And this guy absolutely goes over the top. According to NASA, the moon is beginning to rust. This is really interesting because the Bible says that in the end times, the moon will begin to turn to the color of blood. So let's check out some of his clips. It gets weird. Let's get into it. Proof of God, part three. According to NASA, the moon is beginning to rust. This is really interesting because the Bible says that in the end times, the moon will begin to turn to the color of blood. And some of you very quickly would probably point out that rust is not the color of blood. But this is not any ordinary type of rust, this is hematitic rust. And the root word hema in hematite means blood in Greek. So as the Bible says the moon will turn into the color of blood, we are beginning to see that happen. No, we're not beginning to see the moon turn to blood. Scientists have discovered hematite on the moon, which is a type of rust. Hematite is a unique type of rust with lots of mystical claims surrounding it, but ultimately it's nothing special. Finding rust and the entire moon turning to rust are two different things. I promise the entire moon is not going to turn to rust. If that really does happen, then I solemnly swear to eat my shoes on camera. Rust is nothing more than the process of oxygen mixing with iron. The chemical reaction to take place, depending on the type of rust, you usually need a couple things present. Just like you need fuel, oxygen, and an ignition source to produce fire, you need iron and either water or oxygen to create rust. It's interesting they found hematite on the moon because there's so much hydrogen around, it would typically make rust formation very difficult, but it's nothing more than a mild scientific marvel. It isn't unexplainable, it isn't miraculous, it isn't mystical. Mars is red for a very similar reason, but you aren't using that as some sign of a miracle. Hematite is actually used by New Age wooey people as some kind of special material that absorbs energy. They make all kinds of weird claims about it. Check out this meme. My boyfriend got me a hematite ring that breaks when it's absorbed too much negative energy for my life. It only took a month and I needed a new one. Somebody responded, I need to start selling poor quality products and marketing them like this. The fact that hematite is viewed so mystically only adds to the ridiculousness of the video. Let's keep watching. We are watching the Bible unfold before our very eyes. There really does exist a higher intelligence who ordered our universe. He has displayed his supreme power to all of mankind. God is real and he designed life itself. My message to you is to read the gospel. The day that you take your last breath, you will stand before God. Unless you have put your faith into the gospel, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And this is what I like to call fear tactics. If you don't believe this bizarre, shaky claim I made, then I'm gonna scare you into it. Belief in this ideology shouldn't be based on fear. It should be based on the truth value of the claims. This is just one in a long series of proof of God videos, so let's check out the next one. Maybe he'll be more convincing this time around. Proof of God, part 10. Light is the reason that you and I exist. Thanks to a new field of science called quantum electrodynamics, we know that the atom is only functioning because of light. And the Bible says that God is light, and through him all things hold together. What these particle physicists have discovered is that when the electron goes from one energy level to another energy level, it either emits photons or it absorbs photons. In other words, the entire atom is only in an energetic state, meaning it's only functioning due to the absorption or emission of photons, light particles. So because of light, you and I exist. And like it says in the Bible, God is light and through him, all things hold together. That's literally what science has just discovered just discovered? I don't know about that, buckaroo. Science has known about this for a very long time. They taught this to me in college chemistry classes like 10 years ago. I have no idea how long they've known about this, but it's not a recent discovery. I find it fascinating that this dude is willing to accept science when it fits his narrative about God being real and the Bible being true, but the moment it contradicts him, he practically pretends science is a new religion. Chemistry and biology are extremely complex fields. Why trust this science but not evolutionary 
evolutionary biology. You can't have it both ways. Either scientists are lying to us, or they're giving us accurate information. Why do you choose to trust this one science fact, but deny gene mutation and duplication? We learned about these processes in basically the exact same way, through a system of hypothesizing, testing, and falsifying. Why is this science trustworthy? You haven't sold me on the premise either. Electrons jump between valence bands, which emit or absorb photons when they jump, therefore God? I'm not seeing the connection. Out of curiosity, I looked up the verse he just quoted, 1 John 1, 5, in the interlinear version of the Bible. This version of the Bible has each individual word in the original language, and it shows a direct English translation for every single word. This is literally what the Bible says at 1 John 1, 5. Quote, and is this the message that we have heard from him and we preach to you that blank, presumably no direct translation for that word, God light is and darkness in him not is none. End quote. Okay, it's a little hard to decipher, but it sounds to me like it's using the word light as a synonym for goodness because it uses the word darkness as a synonym for evil in the same sentence. I'd probably be a little more willing to accept this as evidence if we saw even a hint of this kind of thing in the Bible. But not only is the Bible scientifically inaccurate from beginning to end, it gets simple stuff wrong. Stuff they knew back then. Stuff that was easily calculated. But if the Bible really was alluding to valence bands, then we'd also expect it to get information about stars correct, right? Why does it say the stars will fall from the sky when Jesus comes back? The stars are huge balls of gas burning billions of miles away. They aren't falling to the ground anytime soon. If you think this is pedantic, spare me. The dude just said that God knew how valence bands worked in atoms, and he specifically told his people to say that he is light so that when they discover valence bands, we'd believe that electrons were absorbing and releasing pieces of God. There is no level of pedantic that is too far for somebody who may makes an argument like this. Before we continue, I wanted to mention something. A good friend of mine, a YouTuber named Vice Rhino, just went through a horrific experience. He's been with his wife since high school. They went to prom together. They have three kids. My wife plays Dungeons and Dragons with him every week. And the other day, we got a message saying she suffered a massive stroke. She was dead by morning. She was a good person and deserves to be remembered. Now he has to figure out how to be a single father and a widower after spending the majority of their lives together. If you can find some way to support him, I know he would appreciate it. And I would appreciate it too. The last tweets she ever sent were for a fundraiser to donate money to kids whose parents couldn't afford a good Christmas. She did not deserve this. I just did a guest video over there about the TikToker David Ladding so he can take time off to deal with everything going on in his life. Anyways, let's watch the next clip. The next one is actually an old argument. Years ago, there were a bunch of preachers going around claiming that Jesus' cross was in our DNA. Check this out. Undeniable proof of God. This protein adhesion molecule called laminin holds your entire body together and it's in the exact shape of a cross. What's even more insane is that the Bible says in Colossians 1.17, in him, all things hold together. Literally, your body is held together by the cross. Are you kidding me? I thought you just said undeniable evidence. There's something in psychology called apophenia. In 1976, the Viking spacecraft entered orbit around Mars and started snapping thousands of pictures. We didn't have many close-up images of it at the time, so it was a big deal. And what did they find? They found this. The public went absolutely nutter butters over it. Newspapers published articles about how it must have been created by an intelligent being and everything. The resemblance to a human face was uncanny. It was such a massively big deal that scientists went out of their way to take more pictures of it to prove that the public had lost their collective minds. In 2001, they snapped this higher resolution picture of the area. Apophenia, the human propensity to seek patterns in random information. We evolved to recognize patterns like this. It was advantageous to our ancestors. If you're standing there and you see a bush rustle, you have two choices. You could assume there's nothing there. It was just the wind. If that's the case, you're fine. If you thought it was the wind, but it actually was a wild animal coming to eat you, it's over. On the other hand, if you hear the bush move and you assume it is a wild animal coming to eat you, even if it's not, you've survived one more day. Type 1 errors and type 2 errors. False negatives and false positives. We evolved to believe that there really is something there in the shadows, watching, even if there isn't. It was more evolutionarily advantageous to us to believe there really is a pattern there, even if there isn't. That's also partly why we're so prone to conspiracy theories, seeing patterns where there really aren't any. Sadly, Benjamin Weber fell for it. Let's keep watching. But there's even more to this. 
The back of your brainstem resembles Jesus Christ in a crucifixion posture. He really does hold all things together. You might disagree with me on this evidence, but I have more parts to this series. You are a human being who is made to have fellowship with your creator. You were meant to experience the fullness and the beauty of God. Well, as he said, he had more parts to the series. Although he did say this was undeniable proof of God. I guess even he realizes it's flimsy at best. Okay, well, I've debunked like four of them so far. Let's take a look at the next one, the pigeon. Proof of God part six, the pigeon. Researchers dropped a pigeon off all the way down in the bottom of Africa and it flew all the way back home to England. That's thousands of miles. And not only did it just fly home, it flew straight home. And scientists were like, how in the heck is it doing this? So they suggested that maybe the bird has an ability to recognize the magnetic fields of the Earth and tell which way is north or east or south or west, etc. But according to their peer review study, magnetic fields have nothing to do with their ability to find their way home. Just another one of those things you got taught in school that's false. Not true. I'm not sure which study he's referencing there, but first of all, the study says that their specific experiments have quote unquote failed to demonstrate reproducible responses to magnetic fields by pigeons. I have no idea what this study was about, what the original goals were, and if pigeons were the only birds they used in the study. And failing to demonstrate something is not the same as proving it false. It just means you haven't proven it true yet. There are a number of reasons why scientists believe birds use the magnetic field of Earth in navigation. One of the reasons is because scientists discovered a chemical in the eye that's sensitive to magnetism. That's pretty compelling, though not definitive. But he specifically said it was false. We don't have enough information to call it false, so it's misleading at best. I already know where he's going with the argument, so I'll let him get to it. Let's continue. So the other theory is that they are able to smell their way home. They have a great sense of smell. According to the same peer review, that's not the reason. They plugged both nostrils and it found its way home still. They don't know why it's doing this. So this isn't just me saying that, well, we don't know why, therefore God. It's saying that most animals have a programmed ability to sense certain things that we can't. Your dog knows the storm is coming. Birds are never lost. And you have an intuitive sense to know that God is real. What? None of that made sense. At all. This is a little thing I like to call the non sequitur fallacy. A pattern of reasoning rendered invalid by a flaw in the logical system. A does not lead to B. It's nonsense. So this isn't just me saying that, well, we don't know why, therefore God. Actually, that is exactly what this video is about. The title of this video was Proof of God Part 6. Your argument was, we don't know how birds navigate, therefore, God exists. I really don't know how else to break this down. Let's take a look at one more clip. It's a little long and drawn out, so I'm going to cut it down a little bit, but there are a couple specific claims I want to address. Check this out. Proof of God Part 13. The Quantum Observer Effect. Through an experiment called the Double Slit Experiment, physicists have been able to gain a better understanding of how particles behave. And during their endeavor, they discovered something absolutely mind-blowing. What they had discovered is that observation creates reality. Observation creates reality. Interesting. That's not what I remember about the double slit experiment. I specifically remember an old science video explaining it and making it seem all mystical when it really isn't. The double slit experiment is basically just an experiment to demonstrate that light has properties of waves and particles. In the experiment, they had an electron gun that was firing particles extremely slowly, and they had two slits in front of it. If they act like waves, we'd see them land on the other side of the slits in a certain specific pattern. If they act like particles, we'd see a different pattern. The scientists discovered a way to collapse the wave function and make them act as particles. How'd they do that? By pointing a camera at them as they pass through the slits. Light bounces off the particle and lands on the camera lens, which then allows us to observe. The act of bouncing photons off of it changed the results and collapsed the wave function. That's actually what happened in the double slit experiment. Observation does not create reality, like he's saying. The act of bouncing photons off of it so that we can observe it in the first place is the thing that caused the wave function to collapse. Let's keep listening. The nature of particles like photons and electrons is that they act in a wave function. But at the very moment that these particles are observed by a conscious entity, they change their behavior. When the particles are being observed, they no longer will ever exist in a state of a wave. Instead, they choose a single spot in space and in time to exist in.
Incorrect. It has nothing to do with consciousness observing it. The original test wasn't even observed by a consciousness. It was observed by a camera. I get that it can seem mystical, and sometimes scientists like to make you think it is, but it's not. It's cold hard science, baby. Just the way I like it. Even Schrodinger's cat was a thought experiment and a hypothesis. Nothing mystical about it. Before the observation is made, while the particles are acting in a wave function, physicists say that a single particle in the wave function can exist in two places at the same time. But it is only until an observation is made by a conscious observer that those two positions, one of them will collapse and the other it will choose to exist in. See, I can tell he watched that science video from like the 1990s that was dead set on making this seem mystical. It really isn't. It had nothing to do with consciousness. I don't blame him for drawing that conclusion. The science video practically came out and said it. It has nothing to do with conscious observers. You think we can see an electron or photon with our naked eye? They were using really powerful cameras to watch the results of the experiment. It had nothing to do with consciousness. It was the act of reflecting photons. Let's keep watching. So this begs the question, how and why does our consciousness create reality? Many quantum physicists are led to believe that at the time the Big Bang occurred, the quantum realm was operating, and in order for the Big Bang to be actualized into existence, there had to be an observer present. Notice the use of the term many quantum physicists. Those are called weasel words. Here's the definition. A weasel word or an anonymous authority is an informal term for words and phrases aimed at creating an impression that something specific and meaningful has been said when in fact only a vague or ambiguous claim has been communicated. He said many quantum physicists believe that for the Big Bang to be actualized into existence, there had to be an observer. How many is many quantum physicists? Can you give me statistics? on that? Science works off of facts. Is there a factual basis for this? How many other scientists have accepted this premise? Usually in this situation I'll say give me a shred of evidence. I'll take anything. To his credit he actually does play a clip from some dude making this argument. This quantum physicist believes that this is undeniable proof of God. Go ahead and take a listen. For me there can't even have been an origin of the universe unless there was some consciousness there to perceive it coming into being. This is a lesson that all physicists eventually are coming to, if not the majority by now, certainly a sizable minority, who believe that consciousness must enter into the field of physics in a direct way through something called the observer effect. You observe an atomic system, and the atomic system changes from a, a field of possibilities into something that's solid and physical and real and right there in front of your eyes. He doesn't give us a name or credentials, of course. I intended to look him up to see how many citations he has, but I can't even do that. I don't know. Maybe he's somebody famous and I just don't recognize him. Either way, this dude is using weasel words too. He said this is a lesson that all physicists are coming to. Certainly a majority by now. Weasel words are okay if it's just an informal conversation you're having with somebody. But if it's a debate or a persuasive talk or an essay, you should come with data. Benjamin Weber is using this in a persuasive argument. I won't accept certainly or probably. Give me data or get the fuck out. I think if I could give one message to Benjamin here, I would tell him to think about whether whether or not pattern recognition is working against him here. Is it possible that maybe you're seeing things that aren't really there? Not to mention the fact that he made a bunch of giant logical leaps, like pigeons don't smell their way home, so that means God is real. I get it, you want God to be real, but you have to come to the conclusion in an intellectually honest way. If you can't know something without using intellectual dishonesty, then it isn't worth knowing. Anyways, that's all I've got for you. Thanks for watching, guys.